Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology and in this video I'll be going through all the key marking points and all the concepts linked to the cardiac cycle and not only that at the end I'm going to be going through a worked example with one of the questions where you have a graph and then the maths linked to it as well because I know that's the type of question that many of you find really difficult. Now linked to the idea of the key marking points if this is something that you struggle to either identify or to remember then why not check out my flashcards because I've been teaching you for over 14 years I know all the key marking points off by heart so I put them into a set of flashcards I'll link those in the description below so if you do want to get the flashcards linked to this topic and to the entire A level then they're just there for you but for now let's get into the cardiac cycle so here's our first question and it's a describe one describe the mechanisms by which an arterial regulates blood flow to the capillaries so for this one you can pause and have a go yourself the sorts of things to consider before I go through the answer would be when you're going from an arterial to the capillaries, you're going from a wider blood vessel to a narrower blood vessel. So think about what sorts of things might be occurring, as well as the fact that the arterial has got elastic and muscular layers in its walls, whereas the capillaries don't. So the key ideas for this then, the concept that links to the muscles is the fact that there's smooth muscle within the arterial wall and that contracts. So that's your first mark, it'd be saying that the muscle within the wall contracts. Then you've got to say, what effect does that contraction have? So that leads to the narrowing, or you could say the constriction of the lumen of the arteriole. And that is what helps to slow down the blood as it goes in and increases the pressure in the capillaries also. Next then, we've got just a one mark tick box question. Which blood vessel transports blood at the lowest pressure? So for this one, we've got to think about the blood is pumped at its highest pressure out of the aorta. because that's where you have that strong force of contraction from the left ventricle so the highest pressure is going to be at the um, aorta after the blood has been transported all the way around the body it would have lost that pressure particularly after it's been to the capillaries where you've forced out lots of liquid in that tissue fluid some of it does then get reabsorbed but some of it's going to the lymph so for that reason because it's the furthest away from when the force of contraction happened it would be the vena cava so that's the blood vessel furthest away from the aorta then we've got for two marks described the function of the coronary arteries. Now these are the blood vessels that are on the outside of the heart. So pause and have a go at this point to describe the function of those coronary arteries. I'm going to go straight into the answer though. So those are arteries meaning they are carrying blood away from the heart but when we say that we mean from the chambers of the heart and in this case it's then delivering that blood straight to the cardiac muscle which is um, within the heart as well. But when we say carrying it away for artery it means coming out of either the left or right vent so it's going to be carrying oxygenated blood. So one of the functions is to carry that oxygen, or you could say glucose for this one, to the cardiac muscle or to the heart muscle. And that is how the heart, the cardiac muscle, receives oxygen and glucose for aerobic respiration so it can continue to contract and relax. Then we've got name the blood vessel that carries deoxygenated blood from the body to the heart and then name the blood vessel that carries blood from the heart to the kidneys. So two blood vessels. There's a range of major blood vessels that you need to know. You need to know the four that connect to the heart, the two that connect to the lungs, the two that connect to the kidneys. So you need to know the pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein. Pulmonary refers to attaching to the lungs. Then you need to know the renal artery and the renal vein. Renal means it's attaching to the kidneys. And then you've got the four that attach to the heart, the vena cava, aorta, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein. So this one, carrying deoxygenated blood from the body into the heart, that is the vena cava. Vena cava actually means body vein. Vena means vein, cava means body. So it's the vein that is bringing the blood back from the body into the heart. Then if it's going away from the heart to the kidneys, if it's going away from the heart, it's always an artery. And if it's going to the kidneys, it's got renal in front of it. So renal artery. So now we move on to some application questions. The graph below shows changes in blood pressure as blood is transported away from the aorta through all of these blood vessels to the capillaries and we can see that blood pressure there on the y-axis. So we've got to suggest why, so it's an application question, that's why it's saying suggest, suggest why there are larger fluctuations in blood pressure in the aorta than there are in the smaller arteries and by that we mean like the peaks to the troughs are much bigger here 
compared to the peaks and the troughs here. So if you've got a bigger change in pressure, that is going to link to concepts to do with how close the blood vessel is to the heart, but also the elastic tissue is going to play a role in this, whether it can stretch and recoil. So pause the video, have a go at how you can use those concepts to get to three marks. Remember, you can bullet point those answers. And then I'm going to go through straight away now into the key marking points for this application question. So the first one is pointing out the aorta is the closest blood vessel to the heart. So you're going to have these higher peaks in blood pressure. But the reason then it can trough as well is you've got that elastic tissue. So it's going to stretch to accommodate that pressure. And then as it recoils at this point, that is then what makes the blood pressure increase again. So that stretching and recoiling is why you get these larger fluctuations. And because it's closer to the heart, that's why you have those bigger or the bigger pressure to begin with. Next question then, explain how the heart contributes to the formation of tissue fluid is the first one. So if we ever think about the tissue fluid is formed because of high hydrostatic pressure. So you've got to link, well, how does the heart contribute to that high hydrostatic pressure? So if you want to have a go, pause it now. I'm going to go into the answer. So for this one, it's the contraction of that ventricle, the left ventricle in particular, that's going to produce that high hydrostatic pressure, or you could say high blood pressure for this one. And then it's pointing out that it's that high hydrostatic pressure that forces the water and those small molecules out of the blood capillaries. So the second part is suggest how well, lymphatic system obstruction might lead to the development of lymphedema, a condition characterized by swelling in the legs. So something that's blocking the lymphatic system, how that could lead to the development of swelling in the legs. So pause and have a go at this one. I'm going to go straight into it. The idea here would be if you've got a block in the lymphatic system, the excess tissue fluid that can't be reabsorbed by osmosis in the capillaries gets reabsorbed into the lymphatic system. So if there's a blockage in the lymphatic system, System, that means you're not going to be able to return that excess tissue fluid that gets absorbed by the lymphatic system. So instead, it's going to build up within those blocked vessels, and that's what will cause the swelling in the legs. We then move on to some maths questions linked to this topic. So the table shows the volume of blood in the left ventricle of an adult human at different times during one second. So we've got zero to one seconds. Here's all the different volumes of blood. And you have to use the data to calculate the heart rate in beats per minute. So for this one, if you want to have a go, pause it. I'm going to talk through it straight away. So we're told that it's the volume of blood during one second. So if I want to know a heart rate, I'm looking for repeating patterns to indicate when the heart rate, or when the cardiac cycle started, and then when you return to the start of it again. So you're looking for repeating patterns. And I can see a couple of repeating patterns here. I can see at this point it was 109, then it's 109 again. And here it's 125, and then it's 125 again. So I could pick either the 109 to 109 or 125 to 125. But what this shows me is that if we do the 109, 109, that means it took 0.1 take away from 0.9. So 0.8 seconds was the duration of one cardiac cycle. So if one cardiac cycle is 0.8 seconds and they want to tell or they want you to say what the heart rate is in beats per minute, we need to see how many times does 0.8 fit into 60 seconds. So for that one, you would 60 divided by 0.8, which gives you 75. So your answer would be 75 beats per minute. The second part of this maths question was use the data in the table to calculate the stroke volume. And that's the volume of blood pumped out of the left ventricle during one cardiac cycle. Now the way to work this one out is look at what is the highest volume of blood in the left ventricle and what is the lowest. And the difference of those tells you what is the volume of blood that is pumped out in one cardiac cycle. So the highest is 125, the lowest is 49, so that would be 76. So the answer is 76 centimetres cubed. Next question then is explain why individuals with significantly elevated ventricular blood pressure experience the buildup of tissue fluid outside their blood capillaries. So this is similar to one of the previous questions, but slightly different, but it'll be the same concept. So if you didn't have a go at that one last Last time, definitely try this one now. So pause, have a think. I'm going to go straight into it though. So you're going to have more tissue fluid or more fluid. It's not called tissue fluid until it's outside of the cell. So more water, more fluid 
forced out of the capillaries. And that's because you've got an even higher pressure, so even more liquid would be forced out. So you would have to say more fluid is forced out. The other idea you could have is that because so much has been forced out, you're going to have less that's able to return because you've still got a high pressure within your capillary even though you force out a lot of liquid, because there's such a high ventricular pressure, there'll still be quite a high pressure at the venule end, so less can be reabsorbed. Or the other concept is, because so much liquid was forced out, maybe the lymphatic system isn't able to drain and absorb away all of the excess tissue fluid. Next question then is, suggest how the dilation of blood vessels induced by certain medications aimed at lowering high ventricular blood pressure could lead to a reduction in ventricular blood pressure. So we're thinking about how does the dilation of blood vessels reduce ventricular blood pressure. So pause, have a go. I'm going to go straight into the answer for this one. So if you've got a dilated blood vessel, the first thing is pointing out that that means you've got a larger lumen or there's a larger volume, so a bigger space that the blood can flow through. That then reduces the pressure because there's a larger lumen and also there's going to be less friction. You could say because there's that larger lumen, there's less blood touching the walls of the blood vessel and that reduces the friction and that also lowers the blood pressure. Next question. In an individual with normal cardiovascular function, blood flows unidirectionally through the heart. So it's just going to flow in one direction all the way through the heart and you have to give two ways by which this directional flow is maintained. So in other words, give two structural features of the heart that make sure blood flows in one direction all the way through the heart. So pause, have a go. I'm jumping straight into the answer as I've done with all the questions. So first of all, there is a valve well there's not just one valve there are four valves you've got two atrioventricular valves two semilunar valves and those valves prevent the backflow of blood the second reason is because of the order in which the atria contracts and then the ventricle contracts so you have your systole atrial systole then ventricular systole that creates these pressure gradients between the chambers and then between the ventricle and the artery so the aorta or the um, pulmonary artery and that pressure gradient means that blood's always going to flow from the high pressure to a low pressure region. This is our final question and we finish with a long answer question, a four marker. The aorta has structural features adapted to its function and you have to state four of the structural features and explain how they relate to its function. So think about four features and then explaining those functions. Pause, bullet point your answers, have a go. I'm going to go straight into these ideas. So first one I've got is elastic tissue and that allows stretching which smooths out the flow of blood. So when you have that force of contraction out of the ventricle, you have that stretching and then recoil. And that's actually what the second mark is here. It stretches when the ventricle contracts. You also have the muscles within the wall, which can contract. You have a thick wall, which helps to withstand the high pressure, or you could say to stop it bursting. A smooth endothelium, which is the layer of cells that lines the inside of the lumen, so the wall of the artery. And that is smooth to reduce friction. And then you also have in the aorta the semilunar valve and that prevents the backflow of blood back into the ventricle. So I hope you found this video helpful going through all of the theory and an exam question. And remember if you're struggling to remember the key marking points then try my flashcards where I've got them all summarised for you and they're linked in the description below. That's it for today. Hopefully see you next week for some more videos to help you with your A-level biology.